Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Jennifer. It is our absolute honor to be able to welcome Jericho Brown as the Yates McGreal Writer in Residence for our summer 2021 residency for the MFA program at New England College. Jericho Brown is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Brown's first book, Please, in 2008, won the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, in 2014, won the Annis Field Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. He is also the author of the collection, The Tradition, published in 2019, which was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award and the winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. His poems have appeared in BuzzFeed, The Nation, The New York Times, The New Yorker, the New Republic, Time, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology, and several volumes of the Best American Poetry Anthologies. He is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing and the Director of the Creative Writing Program at Emory University in Atlanta. Some poets are born and some poets are made. From the first time I read Jericho Brown's work, it was clear to me that poetry was there, humming in his blood, that his was a brain of the stanza and the metaphor and the rhythm and the line break. Urgency there among the music, awareness of the dangers of being alive, of being a certain person in a certain place at a certain time inflicted upon by others. What does it take to be safe? What does it take to be safe and is there such a thing? This is what these poems ask. A microscope becomes a cannon, a peach becomes a treasure, a bullet on the page becomes a bullet in the head. They are too awake, too aware. They are offering us pain. They are offering us hope. Jericho Brown makes the collective individual, he makes the political personal, he makes the mythological domestic. It takes a large soul to do this work. It takes a generosity of spirit, a finely tuned sensitivity. This is the work of a poet who is seeking to love the world, insisting on loving it despite what it has done. I am alive, he says, and so we are alive with him. I begin with love, he says, and we find the love in ourselves. We are here, we are breathing. These poems see us. They build us castles or caves. They build their way inside us. And we are real, aren't we? Or we want to be. We have all been hurt. What happens next? If we are lucky, we enter into one of these vast, vast poems offering recognition or shelter or showing us the way home. Please help me welcome Jericho Brown. Hi, Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, big thank you to Jennifer for that introduction and for having me here for all the work that she has done as director of this program. And I think we can give her a round of applause for that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to also, I want us to also give a round of applause to Andrew. Um, let's do that, Andrew, thank you. Gratitude to the uh, to the faculty here for being my best friends that, uh, that over this last ten days. Thank y'all so much. Thank you, um, um, for all the all the walks and um, and to my um, and to the students. Um, congratulations on this moment. You'll have to deal with each other for the rest of your lives. It's, <laughs> it's one of the most wonderful things uh, to be born into community. 
Um, so I hope you're enjoying that part of this ride. I'm just going to read you some poems. Um, I, the sheet of paper that I had said I was supposed to read for 45 minutes. I promise I won't. <laughs> uh, you know, and hopefully they'll still give me my check. Uh, <laughs> but I will, you know, I'll read some poems and, um, and then afterward, I think there's time for Q&A, right? Good, okay. Where I'm from, we always begin with prayer. So no matter what we're doing, we always begin with prayer. So prayer of the backhanded, not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love, God, Save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. Four day in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Blue, I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 4 day in the morning, toss him in a truck and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house, a boy to keep the lawn cut, some color in the yard. My God, we leave things green. Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss, cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damn difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead and in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, you want to please and pray for the chance to say please to 
I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say, I once had something to do with my hands. Hero, she never knew one of us from another. So my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name, by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is Black. Black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God, it can't get much darker than that. And then um, they said to say goodnight and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses, so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their names. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital where she will settle next to him forever as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing. And it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won, marred him. He'll have a scar he can see all because of you and your mother, the only woman you ever cried for, must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury. No matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you. Um, this next poem makes use of the myth of Ganymede. Uh, and if you don't know that particular myth, I think um, it's a Greek myth, uh, but I think, the, I think the poem will tell you all you need to know about it. Ganymede. A man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like 
the safety of it. No one at fault, everyone rewarded. God gets the boy, the boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying, rape. I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven, that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. Homeland, I knew I had jet lag because no one would make love to me. All the men thought me a vampire. All the women were women. In America that year, black people kept dreaming that the president got shot. Then the president got shot, breaking into the White House. He claimed to have lost his keys What's the proper name for a man caught stealing into his own home? I asked a few passengers. They replied, Jigger. After that, I took the red eye. I took to a side deep as the end of a day in the dark fields below us. Some slept, but nobody named security ever believes me. Confiscated my Atripla, my Celexa, my Cortisone my clonopin, my flexoril, my Zyrtec, my Nasoril, my Percocet, my Ambien. Nobody in this nation feels safe, and I'm still a reason why. Every day, something gets thrown away on account of long history, or hair, or fingernails, or yes, of course, my fangs. I wrote this next poem after finding out about and being confounded by the very long list of people who have supposedly committed suicide while in police custody. Um, that list includes people like Jesus who were in North Carolina who, after having been patted down uh, while handcuffed on the walk from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be booked, somehow managed to shoot himself in the back corner of his head uh, Victor White III in Louisiana, where I'm from, who after having been patted down while handcuffed uh, in the back of a police cruiser, somehow supposedly managed to shoot himself in his upper back. Um, Sandra Bland in Texas, who um, after a day of fighting for her life, uh, was left in a cell where there's video footage of her. Uh, and she hung herself uh, with a trash bag while in that cell, according to the coroner. Um, what's interesting about that is the video footage, the video feed, the live feed of her has some technical difficulty and somehow goes out. And the coroner says that must be the moment at which she hung herself with a trash bag. Mm -hmm. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head and I will not shoot myself in the back and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass, more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke. 
or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Say thank you, say I'm sorry. I don't know whose side you're on, but I am here for the people who work in grocery stores that glow in the morning and close down for deep cleaning at night, right up the street and in cities I mispronounce, in towns too tiny for my big black car to quit, and in every wide corner of Kansas where going to school means at least one field trip to a slaughterhouse. I want so little, another leather-bound book, a gimlet with a lavender gin, bread so good when I taste it, I can tell you how it's made. I'd like us to rethink what it is to be a nation. I'm in a mood about America today. I have PTSD about the Lord. God save the people who work in grocery stores. They know a bit of glamour is a lot of glamour. They know how much it costs for the eldest of us to eat. Save my loves and not my sentences. Before I see them, I draw a mole near my left dimple, add flair to the smile they can't see behind my mask. I grin or lie, or maybe I wear the mouth of a beast. I eat wild animals while some of us grow up knowing what yogi is. The people who work at the grocery don't care. They say, thank you. They say, sorry. We don't sell motor oil anymore. With a grief so thick, you could touch it. Go on, touch it. It is early. It is late. They have washed their hands. They have washed their hands for you. And they take the bus home. So writing is a been slow for me since my last book. I'm sort of working on the same four poems over and over again and i'm going to read you the one that seems to be closest although i don't think it's yet done so um i ask forgiveness fully vaccinated i once saw giselle barbie royale do whitney houston so well i got upset with myself for sneaking past the cashier after having been patted down security frisks you for nothing they don't believe in trouble. They don't imagine a gun or a blade, though sometimes they make you walk all the way back to the car with the weed you didn't tuck well. No one's at fault. That's how they say it where I'm from. Everyone's got a job. I should have paid. Our clubs suffer. The beer goes warm. Our women need to perform for the tips they couldn't earn after the state shut down for good reason and too late. We lost so many friends. We lost so much money. We lost again in yet another plague. My buddy Janir swears he still can't smell his lip balm. Our women need us to call them beautiful because they are. They've done what they must to prove it. And how often does any woman get to hear the truth? Giselle is so pretty. Whitney Houston is dead. No one wore a mask. It wasn't safe, so it wasn't really free. If you don't watch me, I'll get by you. I'll take what I've been missing. My mother says that's not how she raised me. A year and a half, I worried, sure, she'd get sick and die. The women who lip sync for us could die. People like to murder them, and almost everyone else wonders if they should be dead. We got dressed looking for safety today. Who got dressed looking for safety today? Who left home for it? Who got patted down? My mother says what we do is sin, but all we do is party. Even when I'm broke, I can make you laugh. 
You're going to miss me someday. You're going to forget the words to your favorite song. You're going to miss me when I'm gone. Um, we should clap for one more person and that's Allison, who's uh, the proprietor of the bed and breakfast that I've been living in. She made the breakfast every morning I've been here. And I wish I could take, take her home with me for that. You're welcome to make her breakfast anytime all over the world. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm reading to you um, from all three of my books. My first book, Please. My second book, The New Testament. My mother's still angry with me about that title. Um, and and uh, But I'm mostly reading to you from my third book, The Tradition. Uh, I'm also reading a couple of new poems here and there since having written The Tradition. Uh, one of the features of this new book, The Tradition, is a form I invented called the duplex. The duplex is at once a hustle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. And I think you'll hear those elements come through in the poem I'm about to read for you. Uh, big thanks to everybody who came to the Duplex Writing Workshop. It was a lot of fun for me. It seems like y'all have a good time. I love it when teaching can feel that way. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. I'd like to finish with some love poems. Can I read you some love poems? Yeah. Is that okay? You know, you have to ask or consent. So maybe just uh, one, two, three, maybe just four more poems and yeah. Happy to read you some love poems. Um, the only thing you might want to know before this one is that um, Billy Strayhorn uh, is the writer, uh, the songwriter who wrote that great song, Lush Life. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs, and I love every version of it by anybody. I mean, my favorite version is probably Natalie Coles, but even, um, even uh, Queen Latifah has a really beautiful version of Lush Life. Uh, you know, most people think of the best version of Lush Life being um, Nat King Coles. Uh, anyway, I'm always amazed every time I think about uh, that, uh, the fact that Billy Strayhorn wrote a song that complicated when he was still a teenager. Um, I really hate Billy Strayhorn. <laughs> <laughs> Track one, Lush Life. The woman with the microphone seems to hurt you, to see you shake your head. The mic may as well be a leather belt. You drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. A lover's tongue might call you bitch, a term of endearment where you come from, a kind of compliment preceded by the word sing in certain nightclubs. A lush little tongue you have, you can yell, sing bitch and I love you, with a shot of Patron at the end of each phrase from the same bar stool every Saturday night. But you can't remember your father's leather belt without shaking your head. That's what satisfies her, the woman with the microphone. She does not mean to entertain you and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue. Call me your bitch and I'll sing. The whole night long. Heart condition. I don't want to hurt a man, but I like to hear one beg. Two people touch twice a month in 10 hotels, and we call it long distance. He holds down one coast. I wander the other like any African-American. Africa, 
with its condition and America with its condition and black folk born in this nation content to carry half of each. I, sh I shoulder my share. My man flies to touch me, sky on our side, sky above his world I wish to write, which is where I go wrong. Words are a sense of sound. I get smart. My mother shakes her head. My grandmother sighs. He ain't got no sense. My grandmother is dead. She lives with me. I hear my mother shake her head over the phone. Somebody cut the cord. We have a long distance relationship. I lost half of her to a stroke. God gives to each a body. God gives everybody its pains. When pain mounts in my body, I try thinking of my white forefathers who hurt their black bastards quite legally. I hate to say it, but one pain can ease another. Doctors, rather I take pills. My man wants me to see a doctor. What are you when you leave your man wanting? What am I now that I think so fondly of airplanes? What's my name? Whose is it while we make love? My lover leaves me with words I wish to write. Flies from one side of a nation to the outside of our world. I don't want the world. I only want African sense of American sound. Him touching this body, aware of its pains. Greetings, earthlings. My name is slow and stumbling. I come from planet trouble. I am here to love you, uncomfortable. I love poetry more than anything in the world. Um, the only thing that it comes second, the only thing I love more than poetry is cuddling. Um, and so I'm really proud of this poem because it's a poem about cuddling. Yes. Stand. Peace on this planet, or guns going hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything. The cushion of it, the skin and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed, somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. I'll finish with, um, I'll finish with a duplex. Uh, I'll finish with the last poem in the book, uh, which is also the last duplex in the book, there's another layer of form. I mentioned to you earlier that the duplex is at once a formally, a, uh, a hustle assigned and a blues poem all at once. There's another layer of form here as this poem is also a cento. A cento, as you know, is a poem that is made up of lines from other poems. Um, usually when poets make centos, they take lines from other poets' poems. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this, this cento is made up of the, the lines from all the other duplexes in the book. So you will hear an echo of something you've heard before. Uh, that's on purpose. You don't have to think I'm an original or anything like that. <laughs> um, oh, and I love reading this poem because let me tell y'all something about me. This, this poem, being the ability to read your last poem in your book is proof that poetry is the superior genre. <laughs> Duplex, Cento. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road, our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten end where they begin. 
Any man in love can cause a messy corpse. But I didn't want to leave a messy corpse obliterated in some lily field, stench obliterating lilies of the field, the murderer, young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father. Steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. Thank you. Um, so I can, I, this is my favorite part, I, the reading part, I usually shiver and mad and scare, but this is my favorite part, I like to answer questions because then I figure out what I'm, what I'm thinking. So y'all can ask me anything you want, if you want to know anything about these poems or about poetry in general or anything. Um, you love porn. This seems that way. Can you talk about, can you talk about that? And as someone who, uh, I, I struggle with porn and I, I mean, my love of forms, I sort of talked about this a little bit today in the workshop. I really just think it has to do with opportunities to say what I did not expect to say. So, you know, a word we hardly say anymore. It was kind of popular maybe when I was much younger. People don't really say mellow anymore, but, but that's a word that's in our vocabulary. We do know that word and we know what it means, but it doesn't come up as often. So, you know, if I'm writing a poem, and it rhymes in certain parts at some points, some poems dictate. And I say the word yellow, and I can't think of what I have to say when it's time to rhyme that again, I have to use the word mellow. But what's wonderful about that is that means I'm going to say something I didn't plan to say, because I don't use the word mellow. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying? So that puts me in a position where I have no choice but to get out of my head, my, as Keats would say, my designs on the poem, get out of my intentions and deal with the language and see what sentence, what line works best with the word mellow, which is like really ultimately saying, forget you, Jericho Brown, do what you need to do for the poem. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, but then following up on that, that often, that can often take people uh, towards like a bad poem, like a poem that's just kind of doing what it needs to do to fill the parameters of a sonnet. And so there must be some sort of follow-up to after you say mellow, what what do you do then? And well, I ask the poem questions. I mean, you know, so I'm sort of I'm a believer in stages and putting things away and coming back to them, putting them away, coming back to them. And I don't stress out about time. You know, I'm not, you know, um a lot of people from my generation just a little younger, they're like, Oh, I'm on my sixth book. And I'm like, why? Wow, didn't nobody buy your third book, girl? Sit down. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, so I don't... <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like, I, there's no, I don't really, I'm not in a rush. Do you know what I mean? So when I write a poem and I use whatever I use to get to mellow, I'm not convinced it's over just because I did it the first time I did it. I go back and I ask the question poems to make sure that I am fulfilling the request of the poem as opposed to my own request. And that pushes the poem toward a complexity that I actually would not be able to do on my own. That's the reason why when we are successful at poems, when we do write something that we are a little proud of, when we go back and read it, we don't know how we did it. Because we, I mean, if you sit down with your intentions, you can't make that thing. But if you give your intentions up and you follow language, suddenly you make what you're not aware you're capable of making. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I asked the poem things like, who is your speaker? What is your location? What's the problem? How, <laughs> how complex is that problem? And after I ask myself those questions in the poem, given what I've already put, in that, put down, pushes me toward revision, as opposed to me saying, oh, I want my poem to be about this. So let me get rid of this line. Like, no. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kevin, do you want to put your hand up? Yeah. Um, it was really nice hearing you talk about your process, your writing process today. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm curious to know, 
with a po uh, poem like bullet points or um, even fully vaccinated, um, does it seem more specific than some of your other poems? I just wonder if those two started out as a mess of text or if that was something that I know, I know you said you don't set out to write a poem, so. Yeah, bullet points as a human being, as a poem in my first, in my second book called Coliseum, I think it's the first poem in my second book. Um, you sort of remember the poems where this happens. I sort of kind of wrote them and set out somewhere and I was real, you know what I mean? Yeah. Coliseum, I wrote on the way to the bathroom at like three in the morning in the notes app of my iPhone. It was, you know, I had to change one word. I think I had a word like captain. I took it out and changed it to get gladiator. And then the poem worked. And you know, that happens for you sometimes, but only if you've been doing all this other stuff to lead to that. So you got to fail a lot mm -hmm. to get those few moments where you're like, oh, I wrote a poem. Bullet points came pretty quickly. Uh, it needed some revising. But in terms of the frame of what's there, it's pretty much very close to what I first wrote. Um, I remember that experience with as a human being as well. I sort of wrote as a human being sitting on the couch with my own. Um, one of my students was sitting on, one of my former students was sitting on another couch working on something. Somebody was sitting over there working on something. And I had this idea and then I wrote the poem. And I was like, I just wrote a poem, y'all. You know? <laughs> so then I couldn't work anymore. Because you know, if I write a poem and I'm working anymore that day, which becomes problematic. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I'll have things do for work. And I'm like, I, I wrote a poem. But I did what I was supposed to do. Today. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't really play that. So, um, which is so interesting. Because when I was writing this last book, I would write two or three poems like a day, which is stressful, but true. And so I would be like, I ain't, I ain't doing nothing else. But then I would get another idea or another line. And I'm like, oh, but I will write another poem. I'll do that. Do you know what I mean? So I hope I answered your question. I feel like I just started talking. No, that's great. Thank you. Yes. I, I wonder the difference between those, those two answers in terms of giving them time and then like writing it on the way to the bathroom and changing one word and that's dumb. Yeah. Like, so is there a point where you take Coliseum and you're like, do you need more time? Or did you know, like when you change it to Gladiator, it's done? Yeah, I had an idea that it was close, but I still give everything the same amount of time. And I still have friends. You know, the wonderful thing about being a poet, as opposed to being like a violinist or a sculptor, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that you have friends who are also invested in your work as if they are writing it, if that makes sense. Yeah. You have mentors, you have mentees, and the, the investment is different in one another's work. And so, you know, I send stuff to people and they're like, yeah, this is done. Or they're like, oh, it's close, but do you know what I'm saying? So I put things away and I'm still sort of waiting around before I even send stuff out. And I'm always trying to work on a lot of things at the same time. So when I work on my poems, I have them all in a single file. That way I'm not hung up on a poem. I can like work on whatever is at the bottom of the file and just sort of work my way back. Do you, do you follow me? So work on what's yeah, at the top, absolutely. work my way down or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, it, um, it felt like with that poem, and you know, this last poem, this um, fully vaccinated poem that I read today, you know, it's just a little too talky for my taste. There are moments that I feel like are interested in narrative. I'm like, why are you saying all that? But for whatever reason, I haven't been able to cut or change yet. So, which is what, I mean, ultimately what I've been doing for the last like 10 days is like changing um, that one poem. I've been working on that poem, which might be different if I weren't here. I just decided, okay, that's what I'll do while I'm here, you know? Right. Yes. How important is, um sound when you're writing? Do you read your poems aloud a lot as you're writing? They're so rich to listen to and you, you read them so beautifully. How does that figure into your actual writing process on the page? Thank you so much. It's everything. I, I, don't, I don't want to write a poem that I don't want to recite. I want to write a poem that feels good in my mouth and that I would love to hear. Do you know what I mean? And for me, it's always been very important um, I mean, it's always been this way, but I remember my very good friend, the poet James Allen Hall. Um, I was in graduate school and I was, he's my friend from we met in graduate school. I was depressed and down. I was like, I quit and I'm not writing any more poems. I'm no good at this and why did I come here? You know what I mean? And he did this, the most wonderful thing that he's ever, that anyone's ever done is, 
It makes me want to cry just thinking about it. Like in the middle of the night, he like set an alarm and woke up in the middle of like the night and called my phone and left voicemails of my poems on the phone. Mm. And I was like, oh, that don't sound bad. <laughs> that's not even my voice. That's Jane. You gonna read that poem? Read that poem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it was just like, oh, I guess maybe I can write, you know? But I got that from the sound of the thing. And it was very useful for me to hear the sound of the thing in somebody else's voice, right? Because then I was making, I felt like I was making something that just wasn't mine. I was doing, I was fulfilling the thing I really wanted to do, which was making poems, which were mine and separate from me all the time. Um, and so the Jackie and Jackie for him, I was usually, um, you know, I always tell people I get kind of like a crazy person because it's usually just, you know, when I'm writing, it's really just me pacing and chanting. You know, I'm like, like Back to computer, you know what I'm saying? Like that's that's just anyway. So that's, that's what it's like, you know. It's all about the ear and the sound. And I'm also, you know, um, as Alan brought up, I have an investment in form such that the sounds will come up because I'm going to go after. I'm I'm going to go after them. If I see the opportunity, I'll be like, oh, I can make that sound again. Oh, I can make that sound again. Oh, I can make that sound again. And I want that from the poems. Yeah. You mean that you repeat of cadences from poem to poem? And try yeah, to well, what I do is, so, and I sort of talked about this once. So there are two, um, for me at least, and this is sort of separate from tone, which is a one way of thinking about sound. Um, that's a whole talk that I could give on the blues and likes and hues, right? Because, you know, likes and hues, even when the poem isn't a blues poem, it still sounds like blues because of likes and hues' is very special tonality, right? He knew how to manipulate that. So when I, when I but if we talk not about tone, but about um, literal sound in a poem, I think about the sounds in the line, right? And I think about repeating those sounds. So if I say hair, then a few syllables later, I'm gonna say there or air or carry. Or, and if I say automobile, a few syllables later, I'm gonna say, yes, he will. Do you know that like those sounds are gonna repeat? But also that first line, whatever it may be, becomes the guiding principle of rhythm for the rest of the lines. That first line lays down the pattern. And if I get you know, jumpy, scared, anxious, I just need to make a, another line that sounds like that line. And then I kind of calm back down. I'm like, okay, I'm still in the poem, right? And then yes, of course, I'm gonna vary those sounds. I will vary that rhythm, but that rhythm will become the guide for the rest of the poem. The same thing I think, so that's in sound, and the same thing I think happens in image and in metaphor. You know, your earlier images in the poem, your earlier metaphors in the poem will tell you what to write next. So you don't have to be worried about it, right? So in the example I gave today, if you say the linebacker was a bear, you know there won't be any microwaves in your poem. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? If you say something like that earlier, and you know what could appear, you know, there could be some trees, there could be some stadiums, you, but you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then I'll come over there to you, Jennifer, sorry. Okay. I had a question about, you talked a little bit in the workshop today about duplexes in your writing process and your Ziploc bags full of lines. And I was wondering if the all the duplexes that you've written kind of came about that way where you pulled lines that you had already had, or was there instances where you were coming up with lines to make those couplets work? So all of the duplex, so, you know, I think there's something like six, maybe five, I don't know, duplexes in the book. Um, but there were like 40 pages of duplexes at the house. Really bad, you know, the other 35 pages of those are not good, which is why they're not in the book. And which is also why I haven't made, a, uh, in spite of my editor getting on my nerves about it, I have not made a book of duplexes. But I have written duplexes since then, top to bottom. All of the first duplexes were made of conglomerating lines from various points in my life. Because I wrote them, so I don't care that one of them is from 2000 and one of them is from 2019. These are my lines. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I will do what I want with them. Do you, do you follow? That's not somehow an inauthentic writing experience. Do you follow what I mean? Um, so that's how I made all of those. But then since that time, I've been able to 
because I've been working with them so much, I've been able to write them from top to bottom, you know. But not that many. I mean, I just wrote maybe three or four from top to bottom. And one of them I like a lot. I mean, I actually published it. I like it a lot. And the others, I'm just, you know, they'll come back around. I'll keep pushing. Or maybe they won't be duplexes. You know, the other thing that happens when you write a duplex is sometimes you realize you actually wrote a seven-line poem instead of a 14-line poem because you really don't need to repeat those lines. You have to know that the lines bear repeating. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes they don't. So you've got something other than a duplex that you're working on. Which is the case with all form, right? Um, often because I've worked with form, I'll find that I'm writing and I'll write ABAB. And because I write ABAB, I think, oh, I might be in a sonic land here. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it doesn't have to end up that way. But, it, but, I, but I'm aware of it. So I don't sit down to write in form, except when I make, when I made the duplex, I was definitely doing that. But generally I don't sit down and write in form. I'm just aware of what the forms are. So if, the, so if I can use them, I can use them. They can help me, but then some, sometimes they can't, and that's fine. Yes? I am interested in, in how and when and why people gravitate to specific forms. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any forms that, uh, that you're attracted to, that you want to spend time in, but have not yet figured out I'll move through the yeah, well, I mean, I mentioned this earlier today. I really like pantoons and villanelles because I feel like, I mean, I like everything that helps me. And you know, the villanelle tells you when you write a line, that's that same line this time, this time, and this time. When you write that line, that's that same line this time and this time. So I'm like, hey, that's great. It's like already written. I just have to figure out a couple more lines after I figure out six lines. Do you understand what I mean? So I kind of, I'm into that, but, um, and I have a lot of them, but I haven't. There's one that works, but I haven't sent it out anywhere or anything. There's one my friend Sean was like, this was good. But generally, I don't like them. You know, Pantone. I, you know, I have a lot of Pantone that I don't like. You know, I mean, sooner or later, you'll see a Pantone that's looking at them. I'll be like, oh, I like that one. Jennifer, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, so you were talking today about the value of surprise and how it's really important to a poem to put two sort of unlike things side by side to create a, a, you know, that surprise that's so essential. Um, but then you also talked about mixed metaphors. So where is the line there between, you know, having surprise, having the unexpected, pushing the envelope on metaphors, but then not going so far that you're breaking the agreement with the world of the poem? Um. Well, you know, let me say this, you know, that's how Jericho Brown feels, but maybe that's not how Paul Solano feels. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe that's not how, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, maybe that's not how Robert Duncan feels. But you know, and, and you know, to some extent, maybe that's not even how Robert Creeley feels, although I think I think Creeley and I are probably more in line in terms of poetics. I um I don't I don't so I don't know where the line is. I think your poems have to be yours and they have to be original. And if somehow you can make mixing metaphors work, go for it. But I, um, I'm interested in unity and oneness of a poem. I like, so, and you know, uh, different people feel differently about this. And our books, you know, in contemporary poetry are much, you know, uh, part of the reason why I, this crowd, I think, is obsessed with titles, is because of this. You know, now when you get a book of poetry, you get like three titles in the whole book. <laughs> and then suddenly you're turning page and you're like, Am I still in the same poem? <laughs> 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 um, so I'll say this when I think about poems, I think about automobiles, microwaves, couches. Um, you know, even sometimes, in some cases, with some poems, VCRs, do you know what I mean? I think about bread. I think about things that come to use. The difference between those things and poems is that we know exactly the uses of those things. We do not know what poems have done for our lives. We just know that they are doing something for our lives. 
We know they are changing us. We know we're better at telling the truth. We know, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, but we don't know how, we don't know at what increment, we don't understand that. There's no way to track that. Uh, poems are much more, more than they're like those things. They're like trees, you know, like, you know, we like trees, everybody in here likes trees. As a matter of fact, everybody in here has a tree. As soon as I say it, you think of your tree. Isn't that amazing? Do you know what I'm saying? So my relationship to poetry is like my relationship to all those things and trees. Here's the thing about trees though. You know, you could like, pretend that they're about oxygen. But the truth is, what we get from trees ain't just oxygen. Because you could fill the world up with oxygen. You could figure out a way to get oxygen on Earth and get rid of all the trees, and I bet you would miss them. You, but like, what were the trees doing? Why you miss the trees? What were they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why was that reason? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So and I think poems are doing work. So because I believe that, if I was putting a car together, which I would never do, <laughs> if I had all of the tools for a car, and I was put all of the parts of a car, I should say, and I was putting the car together and I came across the door of a microwave, I would be like, what the fuck is the door of a microwave doing here? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, like that. But I would be like, I would be like, I don't know where to put this in the car. And so that's how I feel about mixed metaphor. A, the car is, it has a function and it is one. It does one thing. You know, whether you have your air conditioning in that car or not, or not it really does. You, do you understand what I'm saying? And you know, the microwave does one thing. I'm not gonna take the tire off my car and try to fit it onto my microwave. That's a waste of a tire. Do, do you follow me? So that's really how I think about, it's not real. I mean, you know, we, we say metaphor, we say conceit, we say metaphor for consistency, but I generally to myself am just saying unity. Oneness. Do you follow me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm kind of pulling this, I think, a little bit out of context, but I, I was intrigued when you started listing, you know, the objects or I, I, it, objects, images, you know, the trees, the microwave, these signifiers. And I'm wondering if you also use those items um, as a way to guide yourself when you're putting a manuscript together. Or do you choose to work thematically with putting work together? I'm just curious about how you know you make that grouping happen. That's a great question. Um, I think a little, I mean, for me, putting a manuscript together means using everything I ever heard about putting a manuscript together. <laughs> you know, so I'll use everything you just said, plus everything I learned in school, plus everything from whatever the most recent book that I liked, well, you know what I mean? So it's all, it varies. The only thing that I do that I think everybody else doesn't do, I don't, sometimes things get chronological. I might section chronologically, but I won't inside the section put, make the poems chronological. Um, and I really don't always section chronologically either, but I might, you know. Um, but the only thing that I do that, I mean, and other people do this, but I haven't seen a lot of people do this. I. Um, order my poems such that they go from last line to title. So that when, after you read the last line, when you see the title on the next page, it feels like a continuation, even associatively, it feels like a continuation such that you feel like you gotta read the next poem, which hopefully enhances the reading experience. So you feel like not just that you're in a book or in one poem after another, but that you're in one long poem. Does that make sense? Yeah. That yeah. you can't get out of because every time I think, every time it looks like Jericho gave you a break, he's got this thing over here that's like, so let me see if I can find that. Um, just to give you an example of what I mean. Um, uh, this poem ends, uh, you know that story as well as you know my smile, how it fit my face once I cut each tooth in your well-wrought world, right along with this scar and this one and this one. And this, and then the, the title of the next poem is To Be Seen, oh. right? And then the last line of To Be Seen is, um, I touch as if to make you whole. And then um, actually, I'll read the last three lines, um, maybe more than that. 
Here I am dying while he makes a bed. I'm talking about doctors. Here I am dying while he makes doctors. Here I am dying <laughs> while he makes a battle of my body, anything to be seen when all he really needs is to grab me by the chin. And like God, the father, say through clenched teeth, look at me when I'm talking to you. Your healing is not in my hands, though I touch as if to make you whole. So that next poem, it's associative, but it makes sense to me. The title of the next poem is Langston's View, Langston's Blues. Mm -hmm. And then the last line of that poem is, um, um, there was nothing, uh, the sentence last, this is a section, the le there was nothing I could do about race. And then the next title is a nym. A nym, which is a poem I read for you tonight, is a word that we use in the South. Some of you might know a nym, you know this word. It's a word we use in the South with that person and everyone used to associate with that person. So it's like saying kinfolk. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so then I say this thing about race and then I say kinfolk. So, so that's something I do when I order books. And then, you know, sometimes things are chronological, sometimes things are thematic. It depends on where you are in the book. It also depends on what I have. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a point, there's a point where it's like, this is all I got. Am I trying to make a book with this or what? I got 50 pages of poetry. What are we gonna do? What's up? <laughs> do you follow what I mean? And you know, sometimes it's like wait to be passes for Jericho. And sometimes it's like write this little short book and move forward with your life. Do you understand what I mean? By the way, it's always write this little bit short book. <laughs> I always choose that. And I will read your book if you keep it that way. No. <laughs> yeah, Shannon. And then that will start him. Um Heart Condition is one of my favorites of yours. So glad you read it tonight. Thank you. Um, I, I loved it. I wonder I'm about um, yeah, your approach to, to the love poem. My what? Your approach to the love poem. Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's really all I really want to write. I don't know if the approach is any different, but I'm always excited in a different way when I know that's what I'm doing. When I know, like, Oh, these are guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or even if it's not guys, like if it's uh, because sometimes the poems will be looking at people in love or something, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, Chin, I wish I had a a more fruitful answer, but I don't know that the approach changes. I just I do know this. It's what I hope, you know how, and maybe, you know, I probably shouldn't say this aloud, particularly with students in the room, but you know, you think maybe somebody will have something to say when I'm dead. And I always think what's gonna happen when I'm dead is people will be like, oh, the political black poet Jericho Brown, which is all true. Do you know what I'm like? Obviously, right? But some people will be like, oh, the queer poet Jericho Brown. I just want people to be like, I mean, they can be like all those things, but I want them to also be like the love poet Jericho Brown. You know, it's all I really want is to be like I want to be <laughs> in the canon of people we think of as love poets. You know, even if it's like, I mean, you know, I think of Dorothy Parker as a love poet. Do you know what I'm saying? She was clearly not very good at, you know, love. I mean, she's good at love. The poems make it look like she wasn't at the time. <laughs> You know what I mean? I want, like, I don't know why. You know, it's really not my job. I don't really get to say, right? Um, you know, I think it's silly, but I like it's I want to write love poems. Do you know what I mean? And I want to make plain the complexity of relationship, um, particularly when it comes to queer people, because I think even among ourselves. We, we don't get the idea that our relationships are as complex as they are because the world keeps telling us that they're not. Do you know what I'm saying? So I have to figure that out over and over again in, in those poems. So maybe that's, maybe that is what's different about it. Like, cause I'm probably thinking like, you know, I get excited cause I'm like, I'm doing the thing that people don't get to see as often as I think they should see it or know as often as I think they should know it. Does that make sense? I, you know, the other thing is about this question, in all my poems, every poem I've ever written, I mean to write the poems that I need or needed. So, you know, as a younger reader, I was, as a person falling in love with poems, and I was reading poems really early, like seven, eight, nine, like, you know, I was reading, like I read Life Studies when I was nine years old. That's not even an exact, like why, I don't know. I couldn't understand a word of it. But I read it. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so as a person falling in love with poetry, 
I was always aware of what I wasn't seeing. And I want to make that. And, the, and you know, writing the queer love poem, just it, it doesn't matter how many queer love poems there are in the world, there will never be enough. We got a lot of catching up to do. So, um, you had a question, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, you talked a little bit about not writing the time since your last book and, and working on this one poem over these 10 days. Um, and I guess I wanted to know if you had anything to say about like, Staying with the work and loving the work, not not like being pleased with it, but taking care of it and staying with it in those times. Because I know you also spoke about not being rushed, but like for me, sometimes it's not about rushing, it's just like self doubt or frustration, um, or just some feeling that like I need to do something new. Um, and I just wanted to know if you had anything to say about that. Well, I think first, the most wonderful thing to know is that those frustrations never go away. <laughs> which is great to know because that means every poet you've ever loved had those frustrations and they had those frustrations while they were I mean literally as they were writing your favorite book isn't that amazing <laughs> I, mean, um, uh, I used to have all this uh, doubt about being able to do anything because I am not productive until midnight like I can't think until it's the next day, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I'm always like working till four in the morning. I remember um, thinking, I'm not gonna be a poet. Like, cause I'm like out here like making stuff up as I go and sleeping like, like walking around like a zombie because I'm so sleepy because I have to be at work at nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I remember I did this interview with Rita Dove and we were doing it question by question. And so of course I was sending her these questions at three o'clock in the morning and still like I would send her the question I would go back and work on something and I hear the ding she sends me the answer back at 3 30 because she was up <laughs> and I'm like well if Rita Dove is up I can be up it's time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing you can do is always I mean for me it is always useful to think about my literal forebears like the people like you know my grandfather who was a sharecropper sent like he had 13 kids and sent six of them to college. How did he know what a college was? I have no idea. You know, um, that rural area where my mother's family is from, the white people in that area didn't go to college. They didn't know what a college was. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's special. And so I want to like honor that. You know what I mean? And when I think about everybody who's ever done anything that I think of as a great thing, I also understand that all of those people were absolutely insane. Do you know what I mean? Like people out here talking about Jesus, but Jesus looked crazy. Martin Luther King Jr. looks crazy to me. All of that getting hit by Billy Clubs is crazy. Getting hit by cops is crazy. Bodily harm is crazy. I'm telling you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I feel the same way about writers who take the leap, who do things that I love. And I, you know, I tell my students this all the time. You know, y'all want to write these crazy poems. Y'all love all of these, these. Let me show you the poems that you brought to me that you love. Now, let me show you your poems. Why are you playing safe? These poems you love, don't they say? So you got to lose something. So that's the first thing I would say, is really pay attention to who you love and understand that those people have the same troubles, which means you can do exactly what those people are doing and those troubles won't stop you, okay? So that's the first thing. Then the second thing, I love thinking, I love thinking about like Margaret Atwood wondering if she's going to be a writer. I love that. Do you know what I mean? Um, so the second thing, that I think is a really good idea is to understand poet or writer, um, but poet in particular, since I'm talking here, I guess, uh, to think of poet as an identity. And if you can begin to think of poet as an identity, one that you cannot shake off. There are certain things, you know, if you're from Louisiana, you're from Louisiana, you can lie, but you still gonna be from Louisiana. Do you understand what I mean? Um, if you're of a certain generation, you're of a certain generation. If you're black, you are black. Uh, <laughs> even though race is constructed, whatever, you still black. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there are certain ways, if you're your mother's daughter, there are certain things you do for your mother that I don't have to do for mom. Do you, do you know how to be your mother's daughter? Do you follow, and you know how to get on her nerves. <laughs> do you follow what I'm saying? And if you think of being a poet in the same way, you can begin to service that identity 
the same way you service all the other identities of your life. So you get to say, where are the poets and what are the poets doing? Because I need to be with them. And you get to tell people, I can't do that right now because I'm a poet. So I need to be doing my work. And the more you sort of understand your identity as poet, for me at least, it, that's what created discipline for me. So I'm like, oh, if I want to be a poet, I need to do what these 473 poets I read said I'm supposed to do. And that's be reading books and writing. Okay, well, let me go read a book. And the other, I mean, you know, reading is usually there for us in the in-between time. It's what is what it awaits us. You know, we write, we write, we write, and then we're not writing, and we feel like, okay, well, I guess it's over for me. But in actuality, the books are sitting over there, like it's not over for you. We just want you to read us, and that way you can be directed to the next thing. Any other questions? No? Thank y'all so much. So thank you all for being here this evening. Jericho is happy to sign some books for you or answer any other questions you might have. Let's just give one last round of applause. For that. Yeah. What's up? <laughs>